And that's what Steve Jobs sort of taught me because I talked to him about his garage, how he started Apple. And he said, no, what I really invented was not these products in the garage, but teams that can continue to make great products. And so when I did the book, The Code Breaker, it's not just about Jennifer Doudna, but it's about teamwork and collaboration and how that moves innovation forward. Welcome to Arm Brand with Donnie Deutsch. I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is a show dedicated to a simple premise that everything today is a brand. Every person, uh, every celebrity, every athlete, every company, every product, every movement, every religion, it's all a brand. And basically, I don't want to minimize it, say it's all a brand, but that everything is a brand. Brand is a set of values, a value system. Uh, and what we do here is two things. First, we have our kind of big iconic personal brand interview. And today it's Walter Isaacson, the former editor of Time Magazine. He has written biographies on everybody from uh, Henry Kissinger to Steve Jobs and his newest one in the works is on Elon Musk. And he's uh, just got a, an amazing worldview on on everything political and and talking about his biographies, also Da Vinci. Uh, it's just, if, if, if it's somebody who's changed mankind, he's written a biography. So we're going to talk to Walter Isaacson and we're also going to do our brands of the week, which we decide which brands are up, which brands are down, which brands are driving the zeitgeist. And let's get to it right now. First, obviously we have to talk about the ultimate brand down is the uh, Supreme Court, uh, with the, what leaked this week, um, about uh, that they're overturning Roe v. Wade 50 years later, something that 70% of this country approves on, something that if you listen to every one of the testimonies of the, when during the hearings of, of the, the newer Republican justices, or even the older one, not Republican, just conservative justices, when asked about Roe v. Wade, each one of them during hearings would say, well, there's precedent. We would never overturn that. And here we go. And it is one of the final institutions that this country has put faith in, um, the Supreme Court. And um, the Supreme Court is, is the bedrock of democracy. And we are in a position now in this, in this uh, country where uh, democracy is very much in play uh, with what's going on with uh, the gerrymandering and, and uh, the state legislatures uh, being put in play as far as being able to overturn elections. We know what Donald Trump attempted to do. But this is a very sobering, this is probably my biggest brand down of the year. Uh, that the Supreme Court uh, acted uh, politically. And obviously there's politics involved in the Supreme Court, but it's been the last bastion of, of uh, rule, you know, letter by law. And to overturn this precedent 50 years later is, is frightening. And the implications uh, for women are frightening in this country, and particularly women of color and women of lower socioeconomic means that are going to suffer the most. Uh, if this happens, the... The trigger laws, and I think it's 13 states, 11 or 13 states already, will immediately make abortion illegal. And there's probably another 12 or 13 to follow after that. So half the country will be illegal to get an abortion. And uh, that's including uh, rape and incest. Uh, it's stunning. And here we have a Republican Party that uh, wants you to have complete control of your body when it comes to vaccines, but not have control of your body when it comes to a woman's reproductive rights. So huge brand down. Um Everything else pales compared to that. So I'm just going to say that starting off. Brand up for Nancy Pelosi. She's the first one that led a delegation, uh, the most senior U.S. official to lead a delegation. I, I guess, I don't know if you would call Blinken the Secretary of State senior to Nancy Pelosi. Maybe it's a tie. Um, she led a congressional de delegation to meet with Zelensky in, in, in Kiev. Um, you know, she just continues to amaze me in her leadership abilities. Brand down for Russian yachts. Uh, more than a dozen yachts have worth approximately two and a half billion dollars belonging to Russian oligarchs have been seized in several countries worldwide. Um, the White House said Thursday that the European Union members states to report freezing over 30 billion in assets, including almost 7 billion in boats, helicopters, real estate, and artwork. There you go. So we're going to sell those yachts and too bad on the Russian oligarchs. Brand huge down for Representative Madison Cawthorn. I mean, this is this guy seems to be the poster boy for, for scandals. Uh, this is this is just in the in the last recent times. He's obviously the Republican of North Carolina. He's under mounting pressure from both parties to end his short career in Congress. In rapid succession, Cawthorn has suggested his Republican colleagues routinely throw cocaine fueled orgies, been accused of insider trading, accused of having an inappropriate relationship with a male aide, 
has been detained at an airport where police say he tried to bring a loaded handgun onto an airplane for a second time. He had pictures surfaced of him wearing women's lingerie as part of a cruise ship game. Uh, you wouldn't think it would be coming from a guy like this. And last month, he was charged with driving with a revoke license for a second time since 2017. I, I love the, the Trumpers and the right-wingers who were the most holier than thou and doing the most egregious moral things, not necessarily dressing up like a woman is egregious moral. It's just kind of funny when it comes to him. Brand, uh, I don't know. we will let everybody else judge. I'm going to say brand up uh, for Kristen Sinema, uh, the Democratic uh, senator from Arizona, who bragged that cleavage has extraordinarily pers persuasive effect on uptight GOP colleagues. She's that, she said her secret weapon when dealing with Republican colleagues shows has an extraordinarily persuasive effect. This is according to the excerpts from the upcoming book, This Will Not Pass, by New York Times reporters Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns. On cinema, Martin Burns wrote that she boasted knowingly to colleagues and aides that her cleavage had an extraordinary persuasive effect on uptight men of the GOP. Now, I have heard from women in business that they would say the same thing, that we dupe, duped hapless men uh, are subject to a woman's assets. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I'm going to say it another way. I'm going to say it in a, uh, in a non-sexist way. You know, as a guy that likes to wear tight T-shirts and have his muscles out, you know, show these guns here right now. Um, you know, I think what some, when somebody has their, whatever traits make you more appealing to the opposite sex or the same sex, whether it's your personality, your sense of humor, some physical attributes, whatever you have, I, you know, I, I, I and maybe feminist is going to be angry at me, but... What, you know, I've always, I've always been fortunate. I've worked out very hard and have a, a good physique, and I've used it to my advantage in business. So I don't know. It's, I, I, I'm going to take shit from this, but whatever. Brand down for Ron DeSantis, and really, it's a brand down for uh, politicians who are punishing firms for their views. It's well known now what's going on with Disney that he went after Disney because because Disney came out and didn't support "Don't Say Gay" in the classrooms. And he took away their kind of certain, their, their special tax privileges. But the poll conducted on Thursday by Reuter showed that 62% of Americans, including 68% of Democrats and 55% of Republicans, said they were less likely to back a candidate who supports going after companies for their views. So that's interesting. And that's something for politicians to think about. Something certainly for Ron DeSantis to think about. And a good news for corporations who most of them do not want to be involved in politics. Brand up for Asa Hutchinson, uh, Arkansas governor, said on Sunday he's considering a run for the 2024 Republican U.S. presidential nomination, saying that he's not aligned with Donald Trump. And, and look, coming off the uh, Ohio primary and, and some of the other primaries, we obviously every politician tripping to align themselves with Trump. But I think once you get past a primary, it's not a good thing. And I think these candidates are going to learn that and they're going to suffer in general elections. And I think the candidates that bite the bullet and say, OK, you know, Trump's this and that and it's fine, but I don't align with them here, there and there. I think voters are going to respond positively to that. So we'll see. Brand now for the Fed. The Fed was raised rates this week. Um, but a lot of people think it should have happened last year. We've got such runaway inflation and the economy was on turbo charge. And hindsight's 2020. But they're taking a lot of heat that that they should have turned down the heat on the economy last year and there was the time to raise rates and not keep them at zero with all the money flooding into the economy. And it's it's harder to turn off the spigot of inflation now than prevent it. So obviously the Fed, it's it's not a science, but, um, you know, they're taking a lot of heat. Huge brand down last week for Amazon. Shares fell 14% for their worst day since 2006. Amazon said Thursday it projected revenue between 116 and 120 billion in the second quarter. That was lower than the analyst estimate. And this is a lot more frightening than something like Netflix falling off the cliff or Facebook, because you kind of go, well, they don't make anything. They don't sell anything. And maybe when the eyeballs slow down. But this is an indicator of, of people buying stuff and selling stuff and, and, you know, less of it happening. And, you know, when that happens from Amazon, that's really a tale of the economy to come. So, and we have to give a brand down for Jeff Bezos. He fell to the third richest man after losing $20 billion in a day. That's a luxury. I'm going to give him a brand up for that. When you can lose $20 billion in a day and still have $150 billion left over there. So I'm going to give him a brand up. So let me correct that. Even though he lost $20 billion in a day, probably the biggest day loss, I would say, for any human on the planet losing $20 B in one day. Although, I don't know, when Facebook dropped 30%, I wonder if that was, if I don't have the math in front of me. It's probably similar for, for Zuckerberg. Poor guys. And he brand up Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk's whole thing in buying Twitter is going to be that... Uh, 
it's going to be free speech and everybody can say anything. And he's likely to find out that that is not where America sits. According to an Ipsos poll, 73% of respondents said they support removing posts. They probably have false information with just 20% saying they oppose removing those posts. 83% said they support removing posts that promote violence against particular individuals or groups. And 79% said they support removing posts that pose a risk to the public. So there you go. As far as I'm concerned, brand down for Airbnb says that staffers can work remotely forever if they want. I've talked a lot about this on this show. I do not think that that's good for the workplace. I think you want flexible, um, but not having people congregating together is, is an issue. Um, and he says he noted that permanent the CEO and founder Brian Chesky said he noted that permanent flexibility would allow the company to hire and retain the best people in the world rather than simply those who are within commuting radius around our offices. Airbnb has 6,000 employees globally with more than 3,000 in the United States. But, you know, as somebody who ran a company, ran a company with thousands of people and saw the effect of, of mentoring um, and young people learning in the workplace and connecting, uh, I am not a believer of working at home. So I'm a brand down for Airbnb. Interesting like this, along those lines, brand down for Zoom meetings. It can be stunting innovation at work. New study offers data with employees grappling with how to balance the benefits of in-person work and, and, and with its costs. In a study, in the laboratory study that started before the pandemic, more than 600 people worked in pairs in person or virtually for five minutes to come up with ideas of how to creatively use bubble wrap or a Frisbee. Then they had a minute to pick their best idea. Judges saw the creativity of their ideas based on novelty and value. They found that pairs working on Zoom came up with fewer ideas. Why? Because an often overlooked ingredient in the secret source of collaboration is that a person team members typically share visual cues from their environment and each other that can spur ideas. I and mean, that's where you get ideas from, from looking around and interacting with each other. Um, so um, interesting. I, I'm not surprised there. So we're going to give a brand down for Zoom. A brand, oh, this is ridiculous. Brand down for virtual staff retreats. Welcome to the virtual staff retreat. Uh, a slew of big companies are onboarding new employees and fostering connection between existing ones in the metaverse. Accenture bought 60,000 virtual reality headsets for Meta for its workforce to hold part of its orientation for new hires in the virtual world. The future of the company in bonding experience includes golfing, escape rooms, and scavenger hunts, all attended from your home office. This goes back to my themes of, I, I just, uh, eww, I, 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 it concerns me, this lack of humanity, this whole Meta thing. So I don't know. Brand up for James Corden. He's leaving the CBS Late Show after a successful run. His last show will be 2023. Very often, the Late Show hosts turn over. The last time was when uh, John Stewart lost, left The Daily Show in 2015, and Trevor Noah took over. Um, and uh, he's a talented guy, so we'll see where he goes. Brand up for the Georgia Bulldogs. They had a break. They broke a record with 15 players drafted in the NFL. In the first, it, it, it's incredible. Um, they, were, they finished with 15 players in the draft. They had, uh, how many in the first round? The, two, they had five defensive players chosen in the opening round. So in the opening round, of the 30 players chosen, five were Georgia defensive players. That's incredible. Brand, I'm going to have to give them brand down for Samsung. They apologized for an ad showing a female runner, how a female runner is being interpreted. It's an ad called Night Owls, and it shows a woman, you know, very motivated, running through the streets, at two in the morning by herself. And, you know, she's pumped and she's, you know, it's all about empowerment. But a lot of women's groups have come out. A lot of women have come out and said, what planet are you guys on? That you think it's okay that a woman feels comfortable running by herself at two in the morning? Uh, and Samsung has apologized for the ad. They're still running the ad. And I think the ad is well-intentioned, but a little tone deaf to really what it, like, I, you know, I don't know if I'm running two in the morning through, you know, certain city streets by myself. I, I would do it because nobody cares about me. But a woman certainly has a lot more things to think about, obviously. Brand up for uh, Eli Lilly. Patients are taking an experimental obesity drug, lost more than 50 pounds, and has enabled people with obesity who are overweight to lose about 22% of their body weight, or 52 pounds on average, in a large trial. So anything that kind of helps obesity, we're going to give it a win to Eli Lilly. Brand down for veterinarians or brand down for looking for veterinarians. We, we love veterinarians. We're never going to give them a brand down. There's not enough of them. In post-pandemic, a lot of people got pets during the pandemic. And they don't seem to be enough. Uh, a lot of people rescued pets, which is the good news. But the number of monthly appointments per clinic was uh, up to 11%. Nearly one in three Americans adopted a pet during the first several months of the pandemic, and vets are getting overwhelmed in dealing with the resulting demand. So you got 11% more pets, but you don't have 11% more 
veterinarians and there is a problem. Ugh, I don't know. I'm going to give it a brand down for Burger King. It's a bold new idea. Fast food giant has been testing reusable and returnable packaging. In a test program where customers will pay $1.25 for using to-go containers and beverage cups, they can return for special bins through a partnership with Loop. One depends on the customers actually bringing the packaging back to a drop-off point. Customers will return their containers and refund their deposit with all items professionally cleaned. I don't want reusable packaging for Burger King. I'm sorry, that's just me. And my favorite brand up for the week is Tropicana, inventing a cereal for orange juice, Tropicana Crunch. They found that 15 million Americans have tried their breakfast bowl with orange juice that you can use your cereal with and pour orange juice instead of milk. So I'm going to give that a try. And those are our brands of the week. So let's get to our interview with the great Walter Isaacson. I want to talk about Freshly. And if you want on-the-go food that's pre-cooked, isn't frozen, tastes great, it's not highly processed, it's almost impossible to find, but Freshly does that. It's food that's fast. It doesn't have to be fast food. It offers quality meals without the hard work. Their meals are designed by nutritionists, cooked by chefs, and delivered fresh. Other meal deliveries need to be prepped to cook, but Freshly is ready to eat in three minutes. Uh, look, it takes the stress out of cooking. It takes the stress out of pickup, anything like that. It's food that's delivered. It's amazing. No one wants to spend an hour cooking dinner anymore. No one wants to have to deal with takeout. I really recommend Freshly. Uh, it, is, it is fantastic. It's chef-made. It's nutrient-packed meals delivered straight to your door. No cooking. Fresh and never frozen, ready to heat and enjoy in just three minutes. Use the Freshly website or app to find meals that fit your lifestyle with plans that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Choose from over 50 nutritious design designated entries, like their classic steak peppercorn. Mm, that sounds good. Multi-serve size, like their masterful mac and cheese or the new line of plant-based meals. Skip the grocery shopping and dirty dishes. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week. Stop stressing about dinner right now. Freshly is offering our listeners... This is a big deal. 125 bucks off your first five orders when you go to Freshly.com slash Donnie. That's 125 bucks off Freshly.com slash Donnie. Freshly.com slash Donnie. Check out Freshly, guys. You're really going to like it. I want to talk to you about Chime. And Chime has got a simple benefit for you guys. No one likes waiting for their paycheck, especially when you've got bills to pay. Good thing this Chime. Now you can get your paycheck up to two days early with direct deposit. So listen, this is a simple thing that Chime does. You get your paycheck two days earlier with their direct deposit. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally just feel good about your money situation. But Chime is more than just about getting paid early. It's also a award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional savings account. So check out Chime, C-H-I-M-E. This is a really smart thing. Get your paycheck two days earlier. There's got a lot of other stuff there to help you with a checking account, debit cards. So what are you waiting for? Hopefully, you're not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at chime.com slash Donnie. That's chime.com slash Donnie. Don't wait for your paycheck. Check this out. You got to listen to me. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bank Corps Bank or Stride Bank NA, members FDIC, early access to direct deposit funds, depends on payer. I am thrilled at today's guest, the great Walter Isaacson. Uh, his resume reads like a uh, guy who's had a front row seat to the some of the greatest moments in history and chronicling them. Uh, former editor of Time Magazine, former uh, CEO of, of um, CNN, former president of the Aspen Institute. Uh, his, his books are, are a who's who of people who've kind of set the tone for our times. Biographies of Kissinger and Benjamin Franklin, Einstein, Steve Jobs, Leonardo da Vinci, The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, which is net gene editing, and The Future of the Human Race, which is now out in paperback. He's currently... Um, it, involved in a biography of Elon Musk, and there, as we talked off camera, the goalposts keep moving. He's a university professor at Tulane University. Welcome, sir. Hey, Donnie, great to be with you. Great to have you here. First, we, we got to get right into it on the Elon Musk thing. Uh, at, you know, we're recording this a few hours after he announced uh, he in, wants to buy all of Twitter. You are deep into a uh, biography on the man. First, your reaction to that news? Well, it doesn't surprise me at all. He's obsessed with Twitter. He also has a strong belief in free speech or expa uh, expanding the bounds of expression, not restricting it. And he feels that uh, both Twitter and society in general has constricted free speech. You can argue that either way, but it's something he deeply believes. And I don't think he was ever going to be um, satisfied being a board member and no. a you know minority shareholder. He's somebody who wants to control things. I also think that he thinks that 
the business potential of Twitter has yet to be unlocked, that there can be a mix of subscription models and advertising, that there can be ways to make the algorithm actually promote more civility rather than more hostility. So in some ways, he may open it up to voices from Joe Rogan to whatever, but also he could make it so it's less of a cesspool, fewer trolls, fewer bots, crypto scammers. So I think all those things are on his mind. I think it's a distraction from his core missions, which is getting humanity to Mars and getting us to a sustainable energy future. But he's passionate about this. So you just I'm going to use your words. You said he's a guy who likes to control things. To somebody watching from the cheap seats going, wait a second, are we getting into a dangerous place where the richest guy in the world by $100 billion, so he's not only the richest guy, he's the richest guy by half of, half of a football field, is controlling arguably the most important political social media out there. It reminds me of an old Bond villain movie. I'm not saying he's a villain, but you know where the richest guy in the world starts to take control of the media. Obviously, we've got Zuckerberg with Facebook and we've got Bezos with um, the Washington Post, but are we getting into dangerous territory here? Well, I believe very strongly in competition, and I think the way to prevent this being too dangerous is for us to have a whole lot of choices. Twitter is a big and important company, especially in the ecosystem you and I live in, which is journalists, the media, you know, the conversation about politics. But I do think that, you know, you see Bezos getting the Washington Post, Zuckerberg owning Facebook, uh, Musk owning Twitter. I hope that, you know, there will be other new forms of social media that will always come along. I think it's hard to tell people they can't buy companies. So the best antidote to somebody controlling a company is if you don't like it, uh, go to another place, change the channel. But I'm going to come back to the point, though, that we now have a guy who is the richest guy in the world who basically, at his whim, basically is one person, I guess that's the case in any enterprise, basically he's the one who's going to say, no, Donald Trump should have a voice, I'm a free speech guy, I'm a a libertarian, and... uh, that's just a lot of power for one person. Right, and Twitter has that power now, whether it was Jack Darcy or sure. Parag Agarwal and the board. Uh, private companies have a whole lot of power uh, controlling what gets published, which is why I think you uh, need a, a wealth of uh, competing media outlets uh, so that if people don't like things, they can move on yeah. elsewhere You know, is it different that it's one person rather than a Jack Dorsey who's the founder who sort of controls a board and Jack Dorsey and that board say that Joe Rogan, to just pick one case, can't be on? Well, that's a lot of power for a small group controlling a private company to have. You're asking, well, is it even worse now that it's one person who has most of the sway over that company? Well, um you know, it, is it bad that Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post? Sometimes these things are very benevolent. Sometimes they're there for an evil agenda. And in this case, I don't think that Elon Musk is promoting some personal or financial or bad agenda. It just may be an agenda people don't agree with. And the free market will will, will bear that out. Uh, I, I like- don't know much of an alternative, Donnie. Yeah. I mean... I mean, do we? I mean, the, people talk about the First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment does one particular thing, which it says that government has no way to go in and tell people what can or cannot be said. So, if the government tries to tell an Elon Musk you can't have or buy or create a social of media course, company, of course, that's not the answer. That seems to me yeah. a violation of the First Amendment. So, yeah, it's probably. I mean, maybe the ideal world is where you know, enlightened uh, readers of Plato and uh, history (laughs) uh, form decentralized autonomous organizations and they create a Elysian fields that uh, on Twitter uh, and that the algorithm is perfect and that they keep off Joe Rogan, but let on Donnie Deutsch because they know how to make all sorts of distinctions. Uh, Yeah, I guess you could hope for a, 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 a paradise like that. But I don't really know uh, that government should be the one determining obviously. who get to control 
obviously. What gets said. Obviously. But your, your take, if you were going to predict what Twitter would look like a year from now, just the, the changes that would be made, what would your guess is? Well, obviously, they'll, I, I, you know, what he said, there'll be a, a broader range of, of speech, a broader range of expression allowed on Twitter. That's a simple thing. The more complex thing is the algorithm. Should it be open source? Should the algorithm, should we know what gets promoted in the news feed? My problem with Twitter is not simply that uh, there are people saying bad things on it or saying things that are false or misleading or dangerous, be it about vaccines or something else, is that the algorithm tends to bring people down a rabbit hole that once you start following you know, Brett Baer, at some point you're following Tucker Carlson and then they're pushing, you know, further and further sure. to you getting QAnon feeds. So the algorithm is a complex thing, but if it were open and transparent, which is what I think Musk wants, it may be easier for people to tweak their own algorithms and figure out what they're going to do. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I think that, um, you know, he doesn't, he's a hardcore person. He works 24-7. At 10 at night on a Saturday, there'll be meetings that he's at involving the Raptor engine for the new Starship rocket ship and whether or not the valve should be made out of aluminum and he's drilling down. I don't think he feels that at Twitter, people are working 24-7, totally hardcore, innovating and creating a great product. So I think all of these things will change if he takes over Twitter. You, you've talked about, you, you've, you've chronicled some of the best minds of our time. I, I listed them at the beginning, Franklin, Einstein, Jobs, uh, Kissinger. You've said that what you see, the greatness in, in the parallels with all these people is they're, the, they've all been able to ride the intersection of two dis different disciplines. In, in the case of uh, Jobs, it was design and science. And talk to me a little bit about that. You know, people who stand at the intersection of the arts and sciences, Steve Jobs often said, are the people who are going to be involved in the most creativity. Uh, he always had a street signs, the intersection of the arts and technology. And he said, that's where Apple stands. And that's why he was able to do things like not just make great computer code, but make things like the iPod and the iPhone that were objects of desire and total beauty. If you look at the people I have found the most creative in the, my career of writing about them, they're people who are interested in everything. Benjamin Franklin and Leonardo da Vinci, two of my subjects, are the exemplars of that. They are the people in history who best tried to know everything you could possibly learn about every subject that was knowable, from art to anatomy, from music to math. And you see it in the patterns and the beauty, whether it be the Mona Lisa or the use of Newtonian checks and balances when Franklin helps construct a federal union for the United States. Jennifer Doudna, the code breaker in my book about gene editing, you know, loves the humanities, was studying French before she does biology. And so I think people like that understand you have to connect a moral issues to the technology of our time. And this is true, of course, with Twitter, but it's especially true, my book, The Code Breaker, with the one about Jennifer Dowden and gene editing. Now that we've invented easy ways to edit our DNA, it's not up to the scientists, but it's up to the people who can stand at the intersection of science and the humanities, of morality, to figure out, well, what do we do if we can design our babies to be like we want them to be? Um, the book is out on paperback now. And talk to me, you know, when you say gene editing, just from a layman's point of view, tell me how prolific and it, it's going to, you know, you've talked about this bioscience revolution. In layman's terms, break down what, what gene was able to do. Uh, there's a technology called CRISPR. You don't right. have to worry about what it's it stands acronym, for. Right. But it's, you know, clustered repeated sequences that you can find in bacteria and what people like Jennifer Dowden and many others did is they discovered you could take that tool that bacteria use, meaning these repeated sequences, and turn it into a tool that can cut DNA at a targeted spot. Now, in our bodies, we have 3 billion pairs of letters of DNA. And different segments make for different things, whether your eyes are going to be blue, whether you have sickle cell anemia or Tay-Sachs those type of things. Some of our traits are very simple genetic traits, like having sickle cell anemia or multiple sclerosis 
or even having blue eyes is a pretty simple genetic trait. Some are more complicated, like having an outgoing personality. We don't know the genetic markers for all that. So right now, already, we can start fixing the genetic code in humans to get rid of problems caused by simple genetic things. Last year, a woman was cured of sickle cell anemia, the first time gene editing has been used to change a human being so that the DNA sequence that was flawed that gave her sickle cell has now been fixed. It can be done in, for, in embryos and sperm so that our children won't have sickle cell. Our children, we could edit so they don't have the receptors for certain viruses like coronaviruses. That may seem like a real godsend, and it is. But also we could edit them perhaps to have blood that carries much more oxygen so they can be great marathoners or sprinters. Are we can are we, are we getting so into da- are we getting into mass. are we getting into dangerous territory there? I mean, yeah, and of course that's why I wrote the book because we yeah. all have to be part of this conversation. I don't think there's any parent out there who would say, "All right, I want my kid uh, to be born with a bad genetic problem like sickle cell." But I do interview a 17 year old kid with sickle cell, and they say we can design your babies. He said, "Well, wait a minute, sickle cell help." teach me persistence, help teach me to get off the floor in basketball when I doubled over in pain. So we have to think through, even on the simplest ones, how much editing do we want if we're creating designer babies? And do we want the rich, because this isn't going to be free, to be able to design their babies to have higher IQs and to be taller and to have more muscle mass? Or uh, do we want to limit? we can do with gene editing. So the book is about the technology of gene editing, which is pretty easy to understand. But I think if you're going to be part of the debate on how we use gene editing, it's useful to know what gene editing is. And that gets back to your point of standing at that intersection of the humanities and the sciences. I want to go back to jobs. And and the book was just a monster, monster bestseller. Uh, one, one thing in, in that I found interesting in your interview with, with Jobs is that when you asked him what was the, the greatest product he ever created, and for here's a guy that so was such an iconoclast and whatnot, and he didn't respond with, you know, an iPhone or that. He said, the team I created. And that's so counterintuitive to what a guy who had a reputation for being brutal to the people around him. I found that fascinating. Yeah, you know, we biographers have a dirty secret, which is that we sometimes make it seem like a guy or a gal goes into a garage or a garret and they have a light bulb moment and innovation happens. You and I know, those of us on the team at Morning Joe know, that it really is a collaboration, an interplay, that creativity is a team sport. It's a collaborative effort. And so that's what I wanted to show. And that's what Steve Jobs sort of taught me, because I talked to him about his garage, how he started Apple. And he said, no, what I really invented was not these products in the garage, but teams that can continue to make great products. And so when I did the book, The Code Breaker, it's not just about Jennifer Doudna, but it's about teamwork and collaboration and how that moves innovation forward. You also, another theme that with Jobs' legacy beyond his brilliance was that he was mercurial and very difficult to his people. Yeah. Some people say cruel and mean. And when you asked Wozniak about that, he said, well, I would have been much nicer, but I probably wouldn't have had the Mac- Macintosh. Talk to me about Jobs' legacy of, of and why people said, well, why couldn't he have been a little bit nicer? You know, that uh, Wired Magazine did a great cover story after my book came out, you know, based on my book, which is, did he have to be so mean? And you look at great innovators, and sometimes they have very strong, tough personalities. Obviously, Steve Jobs, to some extent, Jeff Bezos, and now we see it on Elon Musk. And if you're really going to drive change, I know. I've run divisions. I've run companies before. I ran CNN. And I wasn't the world's greatest uh, innovator because I didn't break enough eggs. I, I didn't, you know, I was not it was not natural for me to fire people and get mad at people. And so sometimes I think, well, yeah, you should have been nicer. But as Wozniak said, well, if everybody had been nicer, we never would have made the great products we did. I also look at people who are very nice, who are innovative. 
Jennifer Doudna, the heroine of my last book, The Code Breaker, Benjamin Franklin, an incredibly nice person who brings people together. So I don't think there's one formula. You know, Donnie, after I talk give a talk on Steve Jobs. Sometimes people come up to me afterwards and they say, you know, it's usually a guy and he says, I'm just like Steve Jobs. And I smirk a bit and I say, okay, tell me why. He says, because somebody's an a-hole, I tell them that. And because if somebody does bad work in my firm, I tell them it sucks. And I said, yeah, but have you ever invented the iPhone? (laughs) And they sort of shrink a bit. So I don't think most of us have the right to be a jerk the way Steve was. But... I also think that if you're going to write a biography, you got to explain sometimes it takes a strong personality to innovate. Any parallels in the childhoods of uh, or the upbringings of all the, the, these great folks that you've written about, the, these people who've changed histories? You know, uh, these characters, the, the, it's interesting we're talking about jobs, that one commercial for Apple, you know, where we're talking about here's to the crazies, here's to the misfits, and, you yeah. know, and um, think different. I'm just curious, anything happening embryonically with these people in their early years that you say, ah, interesting parallel. Well, first of all, there's sort of a curiosity that we all have maybe at age three, four, or five about why the sky is blue. But in all the people I've written about, that curiosity, they don't outgrow their wonder years. Whether it's Einstein in his notebook saying, why is the sky blue, or Leonardo saying it, you know, they're always curious. Um, I think a uh, second thing is that, you know, the people I've written about are sometimes trying to live up to something. And in many cases, biographers discover it's all about dad. Sometimes it's all about mother, but, you know, I don't want to get into gender uh, wars here. But Steve Jobs was abandoned by uh, his birth father, abandoned by the first father who adopted him and then adopted uh, and had a great father who was an auto mechanic when he was growing up. You know, likewise, Leonardo da Vinci is born out of wedlock, never legitimized by his father. Uh, Einstein, Ben Franklin, you know, runs away. They are all trying to live up to some ideal or live down some ideal. There's a wonderful sentence in Barack Obama's memoirs, which is that every successful man is either trying to live up to his father or live down his father's sins. And I guess both explain me. So I think that happens to be true of a lot of people I've written about. Let's talk about the state of politics. And and um, you said one of the reasons you moved to New Orleans a few years ago was yeah. you wanted to, quote unquote, get local. And that where you, you felt that already in the D.C.'s and the, and the, and the New York's that the bitterness had sunken in to a, a really uh, to a heightened sense that you kind of said, let me let me go back where maybe that hasn't sunken so much. Yeah, if you want to get really depressed and pessimistic, you can look at our national politics. You can even look at major races like Senate races, how bad they are. And if you want to get optimistic about what America is about, you can go to towns across this country in which innovators and entrepreneurs are creating an ecosystem that reminds me of whether it be, you know, uh, Silicon Valley in the 1970s or Philadelphia in the 1770s. Come to New Orleans, come to Austin, come to Chattanooga, to uh, Columbus, Ohio. These are places in which the discord hasn't seeped in and people are trying to make things better. Just yesterday, we opened an innovation center at Tulane, where I work. Uh, My wife is part of New Orleans Entrepreneurs Week, Idea Village. And so in places like New Orleans and places all over this country, there are people who go back and say, let's create the type of atmosphere that gives people opportunity, that restores some civility, and that shows that we're all in the same boat. I mean, if you're in New Orleans, you're literally in the same boat because we all have to survive the same storms. But I think it's important for all of us nowadays with the poison at the national level to get local. Speaking of poison at national level, uh, you know, I'm holding up my iPhone now. I wonder, is it at this point a fait accompli that we will always be so divided because we we create our, me- our own media. We get bespoke media. You talk a lot about how it was different when it was magazines and they were advertising and subscription-based and that now everything Absolutely. is clickbait and the algorithms that, we ref- that you referred to back with Elon Musk is that 
I worry because technology, we're never, we're, we're always going to be this divided. There are dozens of reasons for the divisiveness and poison today. Technology is high among them. As you say, the algorithms of Facebook and Twitter, whatever, uh, incent engagement. I mean, that's how they measure if they're successful. And engagement is almost indistinguishable from enragement. If you find somebody gets mad about something, they forward it, they get, they watch it. And so the algorithms help make you more and more enraged as you go along. That's true of talk radio. It's true uh, sometimes on cable TV. The people who can, you know, get you the most stoked up tend to get high ratings. That's a problem. And the technology in general is so diffuse. It used to be you couldn't start a TV network that easily. There were three of them, maybe four. Likewise, news magazines, there were two or three of them, or big newspapers. So the magazines, like Time Magazine, had to appeal to a broad audience, had to make sure that it had, you know, liberals and conservatives all reading it, and it became a common ground. But now with digital media, everybody can go to their corner of the blogosphere, their feed on Twitter, their talk end of the talk radio dial, their uh, channel on cable, and that too is divisive. Now, I won't get into all of it, but you know, there are other factors too. I mean, gerrymandering is such a piece of bullshit at the moment. Yeah. It's just horrible. Our politicians of both parties say, let me create safe districts and we'll both have safe districts. We just saw that, you know, in, in Texas. It was just horrendous. Well, that creates people who have to cater to their base instead of cater to the middle. So we all have to try to fix this problem. Speaking of problems, um, Donald Trump, you don't have a crystal ball, but if I said to you, do you believe he's going to run again? I'm curious your thoughts on that. Um, I think, I guess I would guess not. Uh, I think it's, you know, so complicated and messy for him. What surprises me, and I've heard you say this many times on Morning Joe, is that the large sort of majority and sensible part of the Republican Party has not risen up more vocally to say it's time to move on. I mean, watch Mike Pence doing a little bit of that, whatever. But as we watch these primaries, we see people selling their souls to the devil. I mean, you know, the people they believe is the devil, yeah. selling their souls, and they don't get punished. Although Trump then sometimes uh, says, I'm not even going to, buy your soul, take your soul, even though you're trying to sell it to me. Yeah. And what, what's interesting is we're going to see what his coattails feel like. You know, you have candidates like David Perdue in Georgia, who is Trump, you know, 2.0, and he's down by 10 points. And, you know, so I, 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 to your earlier point, I believe the way to, if I was a, guiding a politician, is you basically remind people that he's a two-time loser. You know, he lost in the last election substantially, you know, and he lost in the mid, obviously most most uh, incumbents get suffer in the midterms, but it's not a winning formula. And that this is pre-January 6th. And so tell me the psychology of, in your mind, in, in, in we all can, for the reasons why he has this grip, what is it about him and Trumpism that that is just, it, it breeds this, this passionate loyalty despite, a lot of facts that would, would point in the opposite direction. Well, you know, it's one of the reasons to get off the coast and come back as <laughs> I did to Louisiana or someplace, because even though most of my friends are Trump supporters, some are, and more importantly, as I travel around Louisiana and been in Texas a whole lot recently, there's a deep resentment in this country. There's a deep sort of uh, revulsion against the elites, against people uh, who think they know any, everything and think they can control things. And you can argue with it, but people have become distrustful. And I think it's a deeply rooted, you see it around the world, not just around America. We're an era of globalization, promised us great prosperity with free trade, immigration, uh, automation, all of these things. And it did improve economies but it left a whole lot of people behind. People who maybe can get a flat screen TV set Sunday night at Walmart cheaper because uh, we've outsourced all the jobs, but don't have the dignity afforded them of being able to get on the early morning bus and going to work at the Maytag plant because it's no longer there. 
So I, I just feel a deep resentment against the elites of uh, New York and Washington and California that made billions off of globalization and screwed a whole lot of ordinary working people. Yeah. You get a front row seat every day at the future of being a professor, interacting with 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, the, the future without being too uh, generic. Anything you're seeing in these young people that make you feel hopeful or make you feel uh, pessimistic? I mean, it's well, I'm hard. very lucky to be at Tulane, which is a school of very earnest people who, you know, open-minded and, you know, they're not exactly uh, feeling like the anointed privileged elite who can look down on, you know, anybody who's not woke. And so they're very open-minded. I actually feel a backlash against some of the excesses of wokeness in my students who are saying, you know, I want, I mean, today we're going to discuss whether or not, because I teach a course in the digital revolution. And so we're doing a special section on Twitter today, but they've been arguing that, you know, there should be more speech on Twitter. So I do think that there's been a bit of a shift against the sort of egregious, um, holier than now sort of mob scenes that come down on anybody who deviates from an orthodoxy. And I think some younger people are, are finding that, at least in, maybe not in Northeast universities necessarily, but they're, they're, they're feeling they got to be a bit more open-minded and, dis and discuss things honestly. Yeah, uh, going back to, we're going to wind down in a few minutes, but going back to the free speech thing, um, you are, the old adage, obviously you can't yell, you know, fire at a movie yeah. theater. Where, in, in, how do we protect the First Amendment and we can't put a, a, a council in front of what, as you said, what's, what's fair, what's not fair, but yet how do we prevent people from stoking violence? From If, if, if somebody says on, if, if a politician says we should gather in the street and we should go shoot all the Jews, um, is that... Okay, do we just go, well, that's free speech? Where, where's the line? And I know there's, it's a well, it's impossible question. I definitely think it's not okay. And, I, you know, my line is probably different from Elon Musk, but he and I have discussed it a whole lot. And he fully believes that, yeah, you want to have free speech up to a point. And look, he he's mad at the guy who follows his jet on the transponder and tweets about where Elon is flying. So I say, you know, there are times when you want to censor it. You can't have it both ways. So I think, you know, he's talked, at least I've heard him talk, about you have to have as much possible free expression, but with certain limits. And you say, how do we do it? Well, I teach my course and we start with John Peter Zanger. You know, we've started as a country for 300 years figuring out where do we draw that line? What is seditious libel? When do we tamp down in free speech? you know, the famous cry fire in a crowded theater sure. Supreme Court line. But you have that all of the time, which is, can you extort people? No. Can you uh, threaten people, bully people, li libel people? No. I think one thing we do have to do to get slightly technical here is that on your podcast, on the Morning Joe broadcast, in Time Magazine, if we said something that was libelous, harmful, that 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 caused great harm to somebody. They had legal recourse to mm -hmm. sue us. You because of what is called Section Two Thirty of uh, American law, they're protected. You cannot sue Twitter or Facebook for what people post there. Well, that makes sense. You can't have Facebook and Twitter vetting every post, but there's some middle ground there where platforms have to be responsible for what they amplify, and perhaps the veil of anonymity should be able to be pierced if you've been deeply harmed by somebody and you want to say, I want to sue that person. These are complex things we have to work out in the digital age, but we have 300 years of muscle memory and experience of how to work these things out. Walter Isaacson, you're a scholar and a gentleman. I appreciate your time. The, his newest book, The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudner, Gene Editing, and the Future of the Human Race is out in paperback. We're going to be looking for your Elon Musk biography. It is certainly a work in progress, uh, as we talked about. And thank you for taking the time and how busy you are. Hey, Donnie, great to be with you. All right, you stay safe, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to On Brand. Uh, remember to rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, 
Spotify, Apple, any place, please rate, review, and subscribe, or rate, review, or subscribe, all the above, some of the above. And you can watch our videos uh, on YouTube, please. Tune in and also remember to uh, subscribe there and also leave your comments. Everybody have a great week. We'll see you next week on Our Brand. Everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.